listening to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro, a place to learn about how to grow your business and stay ahead of technological advances before they become mainstream. In today's episode, we're introducing a new business and technology-minded series brought to you by Ingram Micro's SMB Alliance community called As the Gears Turn, hosted by two Ingram Micro SMB Alliance council leaders, Mr. Devin Biddle and Mr. Patrick Cash, both successful MSPs and both ready to call the business of IT as they see it. So with that said, let's make it happen. Welcome to As the Gears Turn. Welcome to another episode of B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro's special As the Gears Turn edition. We're your hosts, Devin Biddle from Computercations out of Frederick, Maryland. And Patrick Cash from Blue Store Networks out of Atlanta, Georgia. Today, we are joined by Mark Romano, the Senior Director of Worldwide Channel Marketing, and Corey Knockreiner, Security Guru and CTO of WatchGuard Technologies. Mark, Corey, welcome. We are excited to have both of you with us today. Yeah, thank you, Patrick and Devon. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, Corey, every year WatchGuard releases their cybersecurity predictions for the year. It's typically a mix of thought leadership and an overview of security threats focused to both the business and consumer audience so they can have a better view of what to be aware of. This year, you're predicting that cyber criminals will find new and innovative ways to attack individuals, their homes, and specifically their IoT devices in the home with the ultimate goal of finding a path to their employer's corporate network. Tell us a little more about the top three to four things that we should be aware of this year. Sure, yeah, we had a lot of predictions, but there was a a big theme on uh, how attackers might go after remote workers, that home connection that still has a connection to the office. So to give you one example, one of our predictions for 2021 was hackers will infest home networks with VPN worms. And a lot of that prediction is stuff that's happened before. So if I impacted it a little, first, if, if your listeners uh, know security and tech, a worm is a specific type of malware that spreads automatically on a network. So once you infect one victim, a worm can kind of scan the network and either leverage vulnerabilities or stolen credentials to also try to infect other devices on the network. Now, home computers are always targeted. Home computers do get malware already, and sometimes home computers have got malware that has worm capabilities. But what's really new in this this prediction is notice I said VPN worms. So one of the things, you know, when malware infects your computer, it can quickly kind of check out the system it's running on, get some information about it. And that includes finding some of these VPN adapters. When you install a virtual private network, you know, the secure way you connect to your office from home. They leave a virtual network adapter and there's some routing information that ties to the virtual network adapter. So if attackers targeting home networks are smart about it, they can actually create a a malware for home computers that looks for VPN connections. And when it finds a VPN connection, which is typically a private network to your office, it can then use worm capabilities to spread over that VPN to the office. So that's one of the predictions. Didn't know if you had any questions there. I can go into the other three. Go ahead. Yeah, I do. I I do want to follow up on that. So with that, what do you see as one of the best ways of protecting? I mean, there's a lot of different ways we could protect that. But what would be one of the best ways we could protect against uh, a VPN worm? Well, the first thing is you just don't want the malware in the first place. So uh, obviously all of us, when the pandemic started, luckily it seems to be lightening up and maybe people will be returning to their office. But when it started, we all had to make sure our endpoints were protected. And I'm guessing a lot of endpoints, you know, a lot of office laptops do have things like basic antivirus. But the truth is nowadays you need what I call a modern EPP or endpoint protection suite. And this is a suite of software that not only is antivirus, but it has more next generation endpoint protection. It proactively blocks malware, not just with signatures, but using things like machine learning and behavioral uh, identification of malware to catch new threats. So it's much more advanced anti-malware than traditional signature based antivirus. And the other thing that EPP suites tend to come with is something called EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response. And EDR is slightly different than your typical anti-malware. You know, mostly antivirus, anti-malware wants to block malware from even getting on your laptop or device, uh, which it does decently. 
but nothing is perfect. EDR is kind of looking for this next level of evasive malware that might make it onto your end, endpoint, but still leave signs of malicious activity, whether it's processes, fileless malware, living off the land attacks, still have to do things on your endpoint. So EDR can help detect that and then remediate it, clean it up. But the point is, you just want to avoid this malware getting on the endpoint in the, the remote worker endpoint in the first place, and then you don't have to worry as much about the VP. And so the, this short takeaway is transition from signature-based AAV to more next-generation EPP suites that include all of the things I just said, plus sometimes a little more. The other thing to do okay. is VPN is excellent. It's a good secure way to connect to, to your network. But you got to realize that open VPN, one that's connected by your user, is also a backdoor. It has full access to your network if someone's authenticated. So you really need to protect that, that endpoint, but you also need to protect the VPN. So look at VPN solutions that do some sort of assessment of the device they're running on before they allow a connection. So like our, our TDR, will, we, we have a thing called threat detection and response with our fireboxes that it can make sure you're running this security software before you VPN in. And there's other products out there that can check if you're running the, the latest antivirus and so on and so forth. Very cool. And I was going to say, I don't have to assume that your products do this because I already know that your products do this. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that's great. That's very helpful. You said you had another, um, yeah. uh, so there's another security number. prediction as well? Yeah, yeah, there, there's a number. Uh, I'll transition around a little. I'll say one kind of more interesting consumer one that gets into our IoT land. We always have Internet of Things prediction, but this one kind of moves into consumer Internet of Things, which nowadays includes smart cars. And I kind of call this my peanut butter and chocolate prediction in that we mixed, you know, peanut butter and chocolate. You mix them together, two different things, and you get something even better. This is kind of the negative version because I'm mixing two types of attacks we've seen in the past. So one, smart car hacks. We do know for the past, researchers have found vulnerabilities in smart cars. They are internet connected. Even a non-modern car, just one that has an entertainment system in OnStar, has a SIM card that connects it to the internet. The, the Jeep hack that was done about five years ago all happened because of an onboard entertainment system that was connected to the internet. But a, a Charlie Miller and Chris Vlasek found a way to use that remote internet hack to actually gain access to the car's CAN network, the, the network the car uses, and all the ECUs, the electronic control units in the car. So car hacks have happened before, but they, they need a way in. So five years ago, big research on this. Haven't seen a ton of new big car hacks in the past few years, but this prediction is that booby-trapped smart chargers are gonna to lead to the next car hack. So besides smart cars, there's also a lot of electric cars coming out, hybrid cars too. And all of these electric cars or even hybrid char cars that have batteries, they have smart charging systems. And so I mentioned peanut butter and chocolate Chocolate. The peanut butter is car hacks, but the chocolate is tying some mobile hacks we've seen to attacking cars. In the past, we've seen one avenue to break into smartphones is via the, the smart charging, the USB charging mechanism. As you guys probably know, USB charging, besides charging, there's a data component there. And there's a number of different mobile hacks like Slurp and others, which leveraged the data connection to kind of hijack uh, mobile phones. One example of this is you can create a booby trap charger that you leave in a airport, for instance. If people plug into it, some vulnerability could allow it to root the phone, or at the very least, they can actually damage your phone. They can use something called USB killer and just uh, overcharge your phone. But anyways, that's the peanut butter. And what we're saying is because smart chargers, smart cars that are electric, have this smart charger. And while it is charging your car, there is still a data component there that's there to protect and manage the charging. It's more complicated than just charging a normal battery. So while it's not like full file transfer the way USB is, that data component, we believe, might lead into the next smart car hacks. 
You know, some people that have electric cars have this charging server at home. There's been some preliminary research where people could actually use a server vulnerability to gain control of that charging server and do things like prevent the, the car from charging, damage the battery, et cetera, et cetera. So we just think that the smart charging component of smart cars might lead to the next smart car hacks. And who knows, in five years, you could see something like ransomware. You get home and your car charger says, if you don't pay $300 a Bitcoin, you can't charge your car. That's, that's uh, the that's last thing I want yeah. is, you know, I can't, at first, now I can't get gas and then eventually I can't even charge my car. Yeah. That's yeah. gracious. It's... I can get gas fine though. I, I put a lot in some Ziploc bags that I have in my garage. <laughs> that's excellent. <laughs> store them, store I'm them. I'm just your joking. Way. Way, kids, do not do this at home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> nice. So the Q4 2020 security port was just released and, you know, I mean, we've kind of already talked about this an 880% rise in malware year over year. Well, and, specifically 888% rise in fileless malware, which we can talk about and define if you like. Well, well, yeah. So let's let's dig into that a little bit because, you know, as we're talking about securing those endpoints and, you know, how this work from anywhere approach is going to continue, you know, through the through the business model. Let's dig into that a little bit, if yeah. you will, Corey. So one of the stats, uh, as you mentioned, WatchGuard releases a quarterly internet security report. You can find it on secplicity.org. In the past, it's typically based on our network security product, the Firebox. We get uh, people that opt in for this. So I'd say about 12, 13% of folks opt into sending the, the malware and attack data home. And we use that kind of threat intelligence to write this report and do analysis of the analysis of the biggest trends. But this quarter, we also, you might know, we acquired an endpoint uh, EPP company. You know, I've talked about EPP and EDR. We acquired a company called Panda Security that does all of that. But anyways, in our Q4 2020 report, we had endpoint data for the first time based on Panda's findings throughout 2019 and 2020. So we looked at all the, the malware trends for the past two years. And one big statistic that stood out to us is fileless malware rose 888%. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of the security practitioners that listen, you guys know what fileless malware is. I threw out another term before called living off the land. It's, it's really the same thing. There's this two, new type of malware that is trying to get past security controls. If, if you think like a threat actor, like a bad guy, traditional malware is meant to be persistent. If I can gain execution control on your computer, I want to put something there that stays there forever, you know, if I get my best wishes, something that stays there that boots up every time you boot your computer. And that's how decades ago filed F-I-L-E-D malware was born. It would leave a file on your computer. It would adjust registry entries or in Linux schedule a job or, or, or do other startup files to get its malware to consistently stay on your computer and be persistent. Obviously, that's good for the attacker because he can stick around. What's bad for the attacker about that traditional malware is, if you think about it, most of our endpoint security is looking for bad files and looking for registry entries. That's what malware detection, you know, signature-based detection is all about finding signatures and files. So when I say living off the land attacks or fileless malware, this is a type of new malware that tries to leave no file footprints on your computer. Rather, it executes somehow from script. It could be PowerShell. You know, Windows comes with PowerShell, very powerful scripting language that administrators use all the time. But if I get a privileged account on your computer, I can use PowerShell to do anything I want on your computer and network. So really, fileless malware is just this, this type of malware that uses usually some sort of vulnerability to get in and then uses scripting languages like PowerShell, JavaScript, ActiveScript, anything it can, normal tools on your, your operating system to retain control of your computer. And by doing it in this fileless way, it kind of evades legacy endpoint detection. This is where you need things like EDR that detects suspicious process activity, weird things happening. Anyways, the statistic was 
fileless malware between 2019 and 2020 rose 888 percent and really the takeaway here is we're seeing attackers transition away from filed malware the traditional easier to catch stuff to this much more evasive living off the land or scripted fileless attacks so if you don't have the type of uh, endpoint protections that are looking more about strange processes and less paying attention to just files you may not be able to catch this fileless malware or as well. I think it really is that next generation EPP, the thing that has endpoint detection and response or EDR. Long story short, whoever your, your endpoint anti-malware company is, WatchGuard if you go with our 8360 or soon to be released WatchGuard endpoint security, you have a really strong mix of many malware detection capabilities. We use signatures, but we also use machine learning. We use proactive behavioral analysis, and we analyze the processes. Every running process on your computer is analyzed. We even do fancy nerd stuff like looking for memory injections and, and other ways that bad guys start fileless malware on your computer. So if you're using any sort of endpoint security that has that modern next generation capability, you're as protected as you can be, but you should specifically ask whoever you trust for, for endpoint protection whether or not they're able to detect fileless malware or living off the land attacks, because that really seems to be where advanced attackers are going. And I can tell you anything that's a legacy signature-based antivirus that's just looking for patterns and files, that's going to miss the living off the land attack. So just, just ask your, your endpoint vendor if they have it. WatchGuard definitely does. And if they ta start talking about things like EDR and stuff, chances are they are also looking for this type of malware too. So the EDR product then, just so I can clarify here, that also incorporates the old style of, of detecting the, the uh, yeah, file. I would say the, the, the EDR well. is the new stuff, but what, what WatchGuard sells, so I'll tell you what WatchGuard does because it's the easiest way, is our, our most popular endpoint product right now is Adaptive Defense 360. And Adaptive Defense 360 starts as what analysts call a EPP, endpoint protection product. But it includes a suite, and one of the critical capabilities, so, so endpoint protection to answer your question, question. Yes, to give you endpoint protection, which is basically anti-malware, malware detection, a lot of next generation companies use many techniques. For instance, we still keep signatures around. It catches only a fraction of the malware, but it's quick. It quickly catches the noise. But then we also use cloud-assisted uh, technologies to use machine learning to more proactively catch brand new files and to put things through behavioral sandboxes. So the EPP, think of EPP as preventative malware detection. Its goal is to get the malware to not even to pre-execution before the malware executes, make sure it doesn't even land on your computer or the second it lands, it gets deleted. EDR, which is a critical capability for EPP suites, so Gartner says any EPP vendor should have EDR included. EDR, is, think of it as post-execution prevention. And what I mean by that is no matter how good a, a, a malware detecting engine your company builds, it's not going to catch every single thing. There's all kinds of new evasive techniques that show up every day. So EDR is designed to catch the malware that does run, that somehow gets that's executed on your computer or is already living there. Who knows, you could have malware in your network the day you install a new endpoint protection product. EDR is more designed about looking for strange processes running, doing unusual things. And so it's much better geared at catching fileless threats or living off the land threats. So I, I would say EDR, don't think of EDR as preventative. Think of EDR as detection and response for the stuff that might make it in, whereas the EPP portion is the preventative stuff. If you buy something like our Adaptive Defense 360, the suite includes both. So when you get the full suite, you get those two things, the EPP and the EDR. And by the way, I also talk about the suite, you get patch management, you get vulnerability assessment, you get disk encryption. So a lot of these EPP suites actually put all kinds of layers of security onto the endpoint. But for malware, the, the two you should care about are the EPP. It should be very good at preventing whether things are new or old malware. And the EDR is there to kind of catch the threats that make it in so that you can actually detect when you've been infected. That's great. No, I, that's, uh, that's very good information.
the uh, world of technology is always changing. So well, security is, is, is <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's at the forefront for everybody. So that's uh, that's good stuff. As we emerge out of the pandemic, the work from home concept has really evolved. Many organizations have seen the advantages that it brings. This is evolving to a uh, really a future where work from anywhere is the new normal. Patrick and I use that term all the time. And I think it's we didn't coin it, but uh, it's certainly I don't know. We well used now, <laughs> you, you think so? <laughs> you, coin it. you can be you can be a new analyst group. We, we, <laughs> there you go. As a result of that, security has evolved as well, and there are some new industry terms that are getting more attention. Speaking of analyst groups, uh, the two terms that stand out are uh, SASE, which stands for Secure Access Service Edge, and is a convergence of WAN and network security functions delivered from the cloud. And the other term we're hearing a lot more about is zero trust network access. So really, these questions to both of you. How do WatchGuard products incorporate these new concepts, and how are you helping your partners in understanding this concept? So for both of these terms, zero trust, network access, or just zero trust in general, and SASE are very much part of WatchGuard's vision. To kind of give you a definition of SASE, like a simple way to look at it is a lot of our network security is built on the headquarters perimeter. So if you think about it, Consider you're a bigger than normal company. You have a headquarters, you have 10 branch offices. Each of those 10 branch offices, that gives you 11 perimeters, including the, the headquarters. And then you have potentially all these telecommuting remote workers, which in the pandemic has, has risen at least five times, if not 10 times. <laughs> right. in, in the original way you would secure that, it was all based on the kind of headquarters as a hub and spoke, really. Like if your remote workers wanted to get to the office, they would tend to make a VPN connection to the headquarters. And that's fine. That could get them to all the branch offices. You could have all these complex mesh VPNs between all the branch offices so they could get everywhere. But think of what that's missing. What that's missing is we now also have some of our workloads in the public cloud, Azure, AWS, Google. And we have SaaS, SaaS software as a service. So all these, you know, it's not a public cloud, but it's some sort of cloud service like Salesforce, Box, Dropbox, name any software service. And when you think of the traditional hub and spoke around your headquarters, you have great control of the perimeter with remote users being able to come in to internal workloads, but all that cloud access is not there. So really SASE at the super highest level all it does is make a cloud instance become the headquarters. If I can put the place that everything connects, whether it's the headquarters, you know, the Firebox VPNing in, whether it's a branch office VPNing in, or whether it's just a remote user wherever they are in the world, with or without a box, just with an agent. If I can get them to connect to the cloud first, some sort of, you know, WatchGuard hosted cloud connection, the cloud can get, then act as kind of this orchestrator that still allows you to get to all the stuff the trusted network in your headquarters or still allows you to get to all the stuff in your branch offices. In fact, I can do even more than that. I can take this zero trust approach where Mark's identity, Mark is, you know, the head of channel marketing. He definitely needs to have access to our marketing file servers and stuff like that. I can give him access to that, but maybe I don't give him any access to the source code repository in our headquarters. So to me, SASE at a high level, it's all about this new topology we have where people can be everywhere, offices are everywhere, but most importantly, we have cloud workloads. How do you get a single security policy to control the security for all of that, even though it's all over the place? And simply by moving the connection point from that headquarters office to this cloud orchestrator that then connects to everything, you turn the solution on its head and now you have access to everything through a, a simple connection. So I hope that makes sense. That's kind of how I see SASE. And then zero trust network access is kind of the remote user version of that I just said. You know, it's kind of disrupting classical VPNs. If you think about it, zero trust network access is the exact same use case as a VPN. The only difference is typically when people have VPNs, they have a open connection to everything 
behind where they're VPNing to. With zero trust network access, you have strong controls over identity. You're making sure the authentication is strong and continuous, and you're using many ways to make sure that person is who they say they are. And you're limiting their access by definition. You're not giving them an open tunnel to everything in every single office in the world. You're giving them very application-based controls where this user, this marketing user, only gets access to these marketing apps and these few all employee apps, but they don't get access to the entire infrastructure. So that's kind of ZTNA on, in a nutshell, in my opinion. Something similar to VPN, but done in a subtly different way that can also connect it to your cloud workloads and really applies the security least privilege principle of only giving employees access to what they need. That was great. Mark? Yeah, so let me just add to that just a bit, just so everybody's very clear on what's going to happen in the future. Here I go. I'm going to predict the future. <laughs> so everybody started working at home last year, and surprise, surprise, nobody was ready for this. Managed service providers, resellers, all these people got involved to help companies secure or even deliver any kind of technology out to that endpoint. I mean, it was a mad scramble to get that done because it was the only place people were able to work. About 80% of the workforce ended up working from home, working remote. There are a couple of things that were found and there's proof points on this. A lot of the analysts have looked at this. We've done our own studies. A lot of people have kind of looked at how is the future going to look now that people are getting vaccinated and companies are opening up again, we're seeing that the workforce is never going to be exactly the way it was. There's always going to be a percentage of these people that are working from home. It could be as high as 50%. And that number is predicated on people who are going to come in the office three days a week, two days a week, the rest are going to work at home. From the company's perspective, they're okay with this. And I'll give you an idea why. People work more when they're at home. There's no commute. They tend to spend more time working on things that they plan to get done. There's less socializing that happens at the office. And therefore, most of the companies are going to be very happy with these people working at home. And everything Corey's just talked about uh, is going to be a situational opportunity for resellers out there to get engaged and really start to understand how to secure the cloud, how to secure these companies on the endpoint, and what are the best opportunities for them to do this and, uh, and create profit for their company. Do you have the Powerball numbers in that forward prediction? I do, but I'm not authorized to give those out okay. yet. So sure. if we can talk okay. after. We'll, we'll, right. we'll, we'll, right. we'll chat later. So, <laughs> okay, good. Um, Mark, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump a, a little further ahead here as well. Devin tells me all the time, you know, how easy and how great it is to be a WatchGuard partner. Can you give our listeners, you know, maybe a brief overview on the program and how it might apply, you know, to their business and help them as well as their customers? Absolutely. So first and foremost, as a realist, I submit that there's probably no one on this podcast that's in the business today that isn't selling some level of security from some manufacturer. I think that's pretty much a given. So what we wanted to do is make it as easy as possible for managed service providers, resellers, system integrators to do business with WatchGuard. So what we did is we predicated our discounts on your training and certification rather than on the revenue you need to sell. A lot of programs are based on how much you sell. If you sell a certain amount, we'll give you a discount. What we want is people who understand exactly what Corey just said. By the way, if all of you are scared, you should be. Corey's really good at this. So if you're driving a smart car, be careful. Those of you who are out there, I'd like you to learn about our products. I want you to learn about the things that Corey talked about. We have tons of training available at no charge. So not only from the technical side, but from the sales side, you're able to learn at no charge. So here's what we'll do for you. If you become certified and specialized on one product line, one of our four product lines, we'll give you an upfront discount. If you become specialized in two of them, we'll give you an additional discount. You didn't have to sell unit one to get that discount. So when you're ready to start selling a WatchGuard product, you've already got a preordained discount ready to go if you learn on our products. In fact, if you are specialized in two of our products, we're going to give you that exact same discount across the entire portfolio. So you don't have to learn them all. You'll learn them over time and give you a great opportunity to cross sell those products into your accounts where you all may already have a solution on one hand, but not on the other. 
as you become more attuned to the WatchGuard products, your techs will come back and say, oh my God, this is so easy to run. I can't believe we haven't looked at it before. You will want to then consider our rebate program which then is based on how much you sell, but it's never your upfront discount. There's a lot of other things that go along with that that are almost too many to explain here. But if you understand the concept that we're more concerned that you're servicing your clientele at a higher level than what other companies might expect, you'll understand why we're willing to give you that discount up front. Mark, the one thing you didn't mention here that I, I want to throw in is uh, the MSSP program, what WatchGuard calls the MSSP program, which uh, most people know as managed security service provider. But it, within the WatchGuard world, it's a little different. It's that, but it's also a program where we buy points and buy the box at a lower cost. And then we typically, it allows us to, the way we handle it at Computercations is we put that out there. It's part of every managed contract that we put out to a customer. It allows us to bundle that firewall in to it, which which is really the core, it's one of the core pieces of the security that we offer to our customers. So it definitely helps from that standpoint. Yeah, it's really an interesting program. We call it FlexPay. And what we did is we tried to align how a reseller wants to buy to how the reseller wants to sell. So we're trying to connect those two dots up. If you want to buy a product outright and own that product and resell the product, you can absolutely do that like you've done for the last 50 years. If, however, you would like to find a better way to manage a managed service or a managed security service practice, you can buy a much lower price box, as you mentioned, and then apply points to that. You can take that box from one customer and move it to another customer. If they're going to upgrade and you want to move that somewhere else, you can apply the points there or stop that box from applying points and provide them to something else. This program has made the flexibility in how you're able to do business so that you're able to put together those packages as you just said, you can price them appropriately based on what you know your month-to-month -month cost is to that month-to-month -month revenue that you're going to be able to stream from your customers. So recently, we've uh, we've seen se several high-profile cyber attacks that continue oh, to make God. headlines. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and as Nuts. a result, security is top of mind for just about every business owner out there. What are the top three security projects? This is a little bit of a tough question, but what are the top three security projects that you believe every organization should take on if they don't already have it in place? My first one is going to be multi-factor authentication, okay. period. I thought maybe it would. And, yeah, that, yeah. and that's going to bring me to also your, if you could touch on it, Corey, one of your security predictions with multi-factor authentication. Yeah, I basically, one of the predictions was, and this, by the way, this is our overstated. We sometimes do an overstated prediction, which is clearly about teaching as much as it is about the prediction. And this is any public facing service that doesn't have MFA will be breached. And really, if you think about it, identity is the cornerstone of all security. You know, whatever security technology you have, it's usually identity based. It's about letting people that are allowed to do stuff to do stuff. Meanwhile, while preventing anyone that's not allowed not not to have access, but you can't make any of that choice until you have strongly validated the who in that equation. Right. And especially in this remote world, I mean, when we're going to our office, walking in the office door and using a physical computer in the office is kind of a form of authentication, but it's one we're missing when we're remote. Digital authentication becomes your only way to validate a user. And my point is, if you're not doing that strongly, you're screwed from the, the get-go, right? <laughs> and you know how we're, people are not doing that strongly. We see password leaks from big companies over and over again. Cracking those passwords show us that users are using bad password practices. No matter how many decades we've talked about good ones, it's kind of against human nature. You know, a good password practice is to use a different password for all the hundred things you log into, and that password should be 32 random characters for those hundred things, right? It's kind of an impossible human practice unless you do something like password management. But even if you're using a password manager, to do that for you, passwords still get stolen and leaked. So the only way to really strongly validate identity digitally, in my opinion, is multi-factor authentication.
I don't care what the quote unquote tokens are. Multi-factor authentication is just about mixing tokens, having more than one token of authentication. For the nerds out there, authentication is, is you know, it can be uh, something you are, something you know, or something you have. Something you know is a password, something you are is a biometric, something you have can be a certificate, a mobile phone, or a special device. Multi-factor authentication just pairs those. And like I said, I don't care how it pairs them. In fact, believe it or not, multi-factor authentication can be easier. If, for instance, my multi-factor authentication is a biometric, me looking at my phone, and a push to my mobile phone, so a, a communication to my mobile phone that I have to approve after passing a biometric, there's no password in that at all. It's very easy. I just have to look at my phone and say approve, but that qualifies for multi-factor authentication is, is much stronger than a password only authentication. So the point is, if you haven't deployed MFA enterprise wide, you're going to have issues. It's the number one thing you can do. It has the biggest return in investment. 90% of targeted breaches start with a spear phishing, stealing a credential. If you have strong identification or strong authentication, multi-factor authentication, that stolen credential is not as big a deal to you because you have other factors saving you. So it can save you from so much things. Before I get off my soapbox for other things too, I, I will say one of my biggest pet peeves is I see all these surveys where 57% of the industry is using multi-factor authentication. And it makes you think that a lot of companies are doing this. This is my, I, I, this is all anecdotal, but my gut feel is when you survey folks, you usually survey the IT department. And the question is, do you use MFA? And the IT department will say, well, yeah, I as the administrator have MFA on a few privileged accounts and my IT guys do, but accounting doesn't. Tech support doesn't, you know what I mean? They say yeah. yes to using MFA when they only have a couple people in IT really doing it. So to me, you're not using MFA unless every single employee has to use it to log into your laptop. So to me, that is what MFA usage means, the entire company. And it's just so you guys know it's easy. Why hasn't people done this, right? This is the follow-up question is if, if MFA is so great, why doesn't everyone do it? And that's because of the old school feeling that it's just a pain in the butt, right? Right? It used to be really expensive servers you had to have next to your, your Active Directory server. Nowadays, it's in the cloud. You don't have to install anything at all. It used to be these hardware tokens you have to carry around and deploy. Forget that. We all have smartphones. Push authentication is so easy. Nowadays, I think MFA is easier than not having it because I log in one time. Nowadays, multi-factor authentication is peered with what's called a single sign-on portal. So rather than me logging into my Office 365, logging onto my laptop, and logging onto Dropbox, three separate logins, I just have to MFA to my corporate identity portal one time, and then all my applications are there. When I click on them, I don't have to log in again because of single sign-on. So not only is MFA easier, if you do it right, you even have to log in less than you normally did in the past. So if you can't tell, I'm pretty strong about MFA being the, the best ROI for the security you can do this year. And number one of, of the uh, projects that you would say to do. Yes, yes, it's number okay. one. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want to go all three. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, give us another one. Would I would decide. say that the next thing is update your back uh, business continuity disaster recovery plan, BCDR. Ransomware, we talk about all the crazy events. The Colonial Pipeline, my joke about Ziploc or gas is because even industrial control systems are having ransomware nowadays. And it would be less effective if they actually had backups and a means to recover from a disaster. -y. You should have a plan to have some alternate server ready to spin up on the go if if your main server goes down and your pipeline stops working. It's kind of 101, but no one takes the time to do it, right? It's always in the heat of the moment, we have all these fires we have to do. Planning for a future that you don't know is coming is seems weird, but you don't want to be in the position where you're planning during the disaster. So nice. really invest some time and money. Uh, and another way to say this is, 
take the proportion of your security budget that you have versus preventative to detection and response. Detection response is about reacting to things that have happened. Prevention is, is the idea of stopping incidents. I think most people spend 80 to 90% of their budget on prevention. And I think it should be more around 60% on prevention. And you need around 30% on this kind of disaster recovery and detection and response. Invest in tools that help help you find incidents that might already be there and help you remediate those incidents as quickly as possible. Because when people, you're going to get hacked. I mean, security experts say it's not a matter of if, but when. Even if you have the best technology in the world, incidents can happen. So not only do you want to statistically lower the amount of incidents you have, but you need to be ready for when an incident does hit. So Mark, Corey, we've been talking a lot of data, we've been talking a lot of reports, and we even touched on briefly in the beginning, kind of collecting some of that feedback from the Firebox appliances. You're, you're getting some of this data back from you know endpoints and, and customer environments. So how does WatchGuard incorporate all of this feedback and, and apply it going forward? So if it's more about the threat intelligence, I mean, uh, for the report we do, the type of threat intelligence or, or call home data you opt into isn't actually a whole lot of information about you, your network, or, or your employees. It's mostly about uh, threat hits. So we track things like uh, we have three different anti-malware engines on a network level. We track the hits globally, you know, what malware is out there, what's being hit, IPS intrusion prevention, we track the type of network attacks we're seeing. So to give you an idea of some trends we've seen from all of 2020, really starting Q2 when the pandemic hit to now, we've been tracking malware and network attacks over the past five years. And starting Q2 of 2020, what we saw happening was at the network, remember this is our network data, not our new endpoint data, Malware was going down. And what that tells us is the attackers are not targeting network perimeters with malware. This correlates, by the way, to the endpoint data we do have. We are seeing malware go up at our new Panda Adaptive Defense 360 endpoint. And that shows you from a malware perspective, hackers are following the user. To install malware typically is phishing emails or something that requires user interaction, tricking the user. So it makes sense that as people started working from home during the pandemic, malware would go down at the network because it's following the user home. Now, the flip of that is you still need network security, though, because another weird trend we saw during Q2 all the way up to Q4 of 2020 last quarter, where we saw network attacks going up. Network attacks, by the way, are software vulnerabilities targeting the services we expose. If you're in office, you have an email server, a web server, all kinds of servers. You may have that in your office perimeter. You may have that now as a cloud workload where we have a cloud firebox protecting it. Those attacks going after network services, they didn't go home with your user. Your network services are still at the office in the cloud. So those attacks going up makes sense because the attacker still wants to, to gain control control of any, you know, organizational equipment. So your question was, how do we use that data to kind of plan? And this is kind of an example. We watch the trends as malware goes down or network attacks go up. We're like, why is this happening? Is this because, and then of course our conclusion was the pandemic and that leads to product management, right? Okay, more people are going to work at home. Like Mark said, we expect people to continue working from home even when the pandemic ends. For instance, there'll certainly be people that want to return to the office, but we think a lot of companies companies might drop office space a little bit and adopt this kind of hybrid work week where it's a couple days at work, a couple days at home. So, you know, by watching where the threat trends are taking us, we also can kind of see where network trends are going and it all gets used in our product strategy, right? Down to even, I gave you a very specific pandemic example, but when we first started seeing fileless attacks starting to show up in our reports, we started thinking about, well, what do we have to do differently to catch fileless malware? Fileless malware is a whole different beast. It uses network activity and other things. So, 
I hope that answers the question, Patrick. It's essentially we pay attention to these threat trends, one, to just guide you with general practical defense tips. But internally, as the CTO of WatchGuard, I'm always working with my VP of product and sharing these trends internally. And it, it shares to us, for instance, starting to adopt this, this vision of SASE for the future. One example, as all these employees start working more and more remotely, you might see firewall as a service become a thing where, you know, right now we have virtual and hardware network security appliances called the Firebox. But one day a remote user may just get all that UTM service just by their through their connection through cloud firewall as a service. So we use we use that data that more technical threat data to help guide our security strategy which leaks into our product strategy as well. Yeah, no, it definitely answers the question and you know speaks to the forward focus and the forward thinking that that WatchGuard is is taking into account which is awesome. Yeah, the main thing is uh, this is a I hate to say it but it's always been kind of a cat and mouse game. The hard part of the defender is we need to do everything right and the attacker just has to find the one thing someone's done wrong. But by getting this threat data and by looking at it every quarter, we're seeing their evolution. We're, we're seeing how they're changing and it's kind of what allows us to have the predictor of the future of, oh, this tiny little threat, this little sliver of data is starting to change and grow. Maybe this is the new attack trend that's going to be the big thing you know, four quarters from now. So we really use it as a leading indicator of where attackers are going. So Mark and Corey, uh, one thing we want we like to ask everybody on the podcast, and we've been asking everybody, is, and, I, and we've get, we get a lot of good answers, is, so I'll ask each of you this. Where do you both see technology going in the next year? I'll jump in first, because Corey's going to have some great whiz-bang story for you, and I want to end with that one. <laughs> Where's technology going? It's sure. going nowhere backwards. That's where I can tell you technology is going. It is going to permeate into everything you're doing in places you're not even looking yet. And every single one of those is going to be a vector for some kind of a hack for somebody to go in and attack either your personal information, your business information, or anything in between. As Corey stated, you know we have cars out there that are now connected to the internet simply by plugging plugging your phone into a charging unit at the airport. Heck, connecting to any kind of Wi-Fi anywhere in the world, you just opened yourself up for a potential hack. The technology is going to still continue at the pace that it's going. It is going to be secondary to the security aspects in order to drive that technology forward. And it's gonna be essential for companies like WatchGuard and for managed service providers and managed security service providers to ensure that they are there to pick up the pieces when the new manufacturers of new technology didn't focus on the security aspect. I actually don't think I have much whiz bang. Everything Mark said is true. Uh, we gloss over this kind of new buzzword term IoT, but it's so true. Technology is everywhere. I, I'm a nerd and I think technology is, is awesome sauce. I think it's one of the coolest things and it helps humanity, but it's all, all also benign. It only helps humanity when humans help ourselves with it. It can hurt humanity too when you have bad actors. And an example I use is I like VR, virtual reality. You know, some people think it's niche, I think it's going to blow up along with AR. I have this really cool VR headset that's wireless. I can be in different worlds. Uh, by the way, telecommuting, I can actually have physical presence with hand movements and write on a whiteboard. A doctor can do consultations and do surgeries via VR nowadays and robots. Really cool, awesome freaking technology. And yet, this wireless headset has four cameras that are 3D mapping every room I'm in. And my headset won't work unless I connect it to Facebook. And hopefully, right now, Facebook is not taking the 3D maps of every place I use my VR headset and putting that in its big data. But it's just one tiny example of how connected this technology is. Me playing with what people think of a gamey VR headset is gathering all kinds of different data and is being connected to big data lakes in the cloud and tech vendors who, you know, to be nice, they're trying to do cool things with it. There's cool things big data can do that help humanity, but as you know, it can also be scary as crap depending <laughs> on how they use that big data. Yeah, I'd be uh, curious so, to see how many ads you get for maybe like floor coverage <laughs> 
rings or interior <laughs> design. Yes. And, and so, you know, they know your square footage of your room. So that, yes. that's, that's a little frightening. Yeah. And if I'm not talking into my ser- my headset, Alexa can probably listen to me. <laughs> I, everyone True. had that thing where they had a conversation with their friend and wondered why they suddenly got a Facebook ad. Doesn't Facebook uh-huh. say they are not listening? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> hopefully Big Brother is not doing all this scary stuff right now, but they have in the past. And, and you can see as more and more. And what scares me about these IoT devices is they're hidden computers, right? You don't think of your little Furby toy as an IoT device, or you don't even think of this v- VR headset that looks like just this wireless gaming thing as a full-blown Android-based computer that can be used to hack the rest of your network too, but it is. So I think Mark's right that the need for security is just going to grow as all these hidden computers show up in every little thing we purchase and have. I'll throw out something fun, by the way. I don't know if uh, this is a kid's movie, so maybe you need a kid to have a... But right right now, Netflix has this cool animation movie called Mitchells vs. the Machines, where a smart mobile phone becomes uh, goes through a singularity and takes over the world. Joking, funny movie. I recommend it highly. But it's, it's really exploring kind of the dark side of where technology can take us to if we're not careful. But I, I think that's what vigilant security companies are here for. That's why MSPs are there to help their customers. So I don't really think it's going to be a dark future. I think the good part of technology can win out. But we do have to be very you know vigilant about how we adopt and use it. That's good to know. I feel I feel better already, don't you? Yeah, Patrick? exactly. Exactly. The good guys are going to win. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll take out the AI robots eventually. Right there, you go. <laughs> and so, guys, we've talked about a ton of information today, which is awesome. Uh, where are some areas? Uh, you know, Corey, I know you've got a podcast um, that that gets produced. Where's Where's some things that we can find more about what we talked about today? Well, yeah, for just general security education and topics, I highly recommend you check out secplicity.org. That's S-E-C-P-L-I-C-I-T-Y dot org. And that's WatchGuard's security simplified blog. It includes everything I've talked about. For instance, we run the 443 podcast, but you'll find a link to the 443 podcast there. And I talked about the Internet Security Report. There's a threat landscape page where you can go to get whatever security report we have out. But you can also get uh, a, a dynamic version of the security report where you can pick a, a certain part of the world and a certain amount of days and see the malware and the attacks happening for that period of time. So simplicity.org. And of course, you can come to watchguard.com whenever you want to learn all about our products. Well, on behalf of De- Devin and myself, Mark, Corey, thank you both for your time. And uh, again, such great knowledge here today. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's always a pleasure. No problem at all. Thank you. There's more information for this episode found on the Ingram Micro SMB portal. If you're already a member, if you're not, we ask why not. If you already are a member, you can access this information at any time. If you have a specific question, you can always reach out to your Ingram Micro rep for more information on how you can be involved with SMB. Thank you for tuning in to As the Gears Turn and subscribing to the B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro. Are you of our MSP, MSSP, MST, UNV, or one of the other zillion acronyms in our industry? Then Channel Pro Weekly is the podcast for you. I'm Matt Whitlock. And I'm Rich Freeman. Host of the Channel Pro Weekly podcast from the Channel Pro Network, the number one source of news and insights for the SMB channel. Each episode covers top headlines and important trends through conversations with channel pros like you and top vendors and experts. And expect us to often ask those guests crazy off-topic questions, debate Star Wars and goats. (laughs) It's the most fun you can have while learning about your future and your industry. That's Channel Pro Weekly. Subscribe now on YouTube or wherever podcasts are found. We would be honored if you would join us. You've been listening to B2B Tech Talk with Ingram Micro's special As the Gears Turn edition, hosted by Devin Biddle and Patrick Cash. This episode was sponsored by Ingram Micro's SMB Alliance. B2B Tech Talk is a joint production with Sweetfish Media and Ingram Micro. Ingram Micro production handled by Laura Burton. To not miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to leave a quick rating of the show. Just tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves. Until next time.